So um, yes, welcome. Welcome to this webinar, to this conference on the theme of gender and land rights in Afghanistan. Um, as I'm sure many of you will be familiar with, unequal access to land is a major cause of gender inequality in Afghanistan. This event has been organised by the Housing, Land and Property Task Force in Afghanistan, um, which is part of it's, it's a subcluster of the Protection Cluster, which is part of the humanitarian country team in Afghanistan. And it's been organised to examine the different ways that women can access land and to see how these can be converted into tangible impacts to strengthen women's rights. My name is Jim Robinson. I'm the coordinator of the Global Housing, Land and Property Area of Responsibility within the Global Protection Cluster. Um, and we at the HLP AOR are really pleased to be supporting this event. It's great to be here. So today we will hear from four fantastic speakers looking at the context in Afghanistan and some of the innovative responses to these challenges and finishing with a global perspective. And then we want to open up for questions, comments and discussion from you, our esteemed participants. So really hope that you will be um, yeah, able to, to comment and contribute and um, look forward to, to hearing from that about that. Just before we proceed, a uh, short practical comment on housekeeping. So please, unless you're speaking, would you kindly keep your microphone on mute and your video off just to prevent sort of disturbances and also any strain on the bandwidth and our streaming capacity. But please do, as you already are, please do use the chat function um, to introduce yourselves, but also for comments and for questions. And we'll keep an eye on those as we go through. And um, yeah, please, please do raise questions there. Um, when it comes to the discussion, after we've heard from our, our speakers, you can either you know raise your hand, uh, you use the raise your hand function. You can, if I'm not seeing you, please do um, sort of you know nudge me, um, and also use the chat function to put your questions forward as well. So myself and my colleagues will be keeping an eye on that. Um, so let's begin. Um, I'm going to ask each of the participants to um, introduce themselves. Uh, and, um, and then they will speak for around 10 minutes. Um, what I'll do is I'll turn my camera off while they're speaking and then I'll, I'll put my camera back on when, when you have around a minute left speakers. So just to um, let you know that we're coming to the end of the 10 minutes and I'll also send you a message when you reach 10 minutes just to keep things flowing. We have an hour allocated for this, but we can. I'm, I'm available to stay on for an extra 10, 15 minutes afterwards if, if the discussion is continuing. And of course, there's also lots of opportunities to, to follow up. So, um, yeah, so I'm going to begin with um, inviting Azima Roya from UN Habitat to speak to us. Now, I understand Azima's um, internet connection might be a little bit troublesome. So if that's the case, uh, colleague David Dominic Maliro, who's the Chief Technical Advisor on the Shura programme from UN Habitat, is going to step in. So um, firstly, Azima, I'll open things up, open the floor up for you. Um, but if, if you need to hand over to David, then please, please do that. Azima, are you there? Uh, okay, uh, very well, Jim. In, uh, in order to manage the time, uh, yes. in the moment as Imajan uh, pops in, uh, we should be good. I'll be able to hand over the floor to her. I will do my level best to represent the women of Afghanistan. Uh, as Maroya, she's uh, my colleague, she's a sister. We do work together in Afghanistan. And uh, firstly is to say thank you. I'm delighted to be among us, uh, the community of pra uh, practitioners uh, who very much uh, work around the clock and uh, keep thinking about uh, HLP issues. And uh, what we are doing with Azima, uh, myself with, with a background in uh, human settlements and urban planning, and uh, previously with a strong background in civil engineering. Uh, so I tried to bring that together. And as Majan uh, to another level, she brings uh, brings in a lot of institutional uh, memory, uh, institutional understanding, and of course the context understanding of Afghanistan. Uh, what we intended to share was um, pretty very much around the question of um, the overview of how we deal with the question of gender, the issue of the uh, the, uh, the challenges that come uh, with uh, obtaining rights for land and uh, looking at um, 
how do we persuade government uh, to be able to look at um, emp emancipation empowerment of uh, women in Afghanistan uh, to be able to own assets, to be able to belong, to be able to participate uh, in, the, in, in the entirety of uh, the integration and integration processes in Afghanistan. Uh, it has not been easy. It involves a lot of uh, head scratching. Uh, some of us went in with uh, black hair, uh, some white has be uh, begun to pop in. Uh, there are quite a number of challenges uh, in terms of securing uh, rights for women in Afghanistan. Uh, some of those challenges are very much cultural and uh, some of those challenges are very much institutional. Now, we are working in a context where less than 30% of the land in Afghanistan uh, is legally registered. And uh, much as within the context of uh, the Sharia law, uh, women would uh, then have an entitlement to a particular portion of the asset holding of the husbands. Uh, when land is not registered, that makes uh, increases the complexity and that complexity is more accentuated, especially so for women who have had to depart from the safety of their homes, uh, from the safety of their mm -hmm. social coping uh, the networks, and have had to be refugees in other countries uh, where that um, uh, sort of a uh, domain of uh, survival uh, is not there and where culture becomes quite a little bit of a problem because then they have to relearn a, a different new culture. They have to uh, relearn how to be independent. And when they return, often they cannot be able to access the original places of, uh, of uh, residence. And um, many times the property restitution are not possible because someone else uh, takes over the property that they used to own or the husband used to own or the family used to own. So this is uh, the context within which we have tried to see how best do we help the women who suffer the greatest of hardship, uh, of insecurity, of natural disasters, how best do we uh, support them uh, in terms of uh, them being able to get these rights. So what we did under the Shura program, uh, Shura program being the sustainable human settlements uh, for integration in urban areas in Afghanistan, was to then use a blanket uh, presidential decree 305, uh, which is um, subsequent to many presidential decrees that are different political connotations, but with a with a, uh, a specificity to return to urban areas, a specificity that brings in both gender. So within that frame and within the 33 articles that are in place, and uh, with specific regard to Article 14. Uh, we did manage to sneak in something that will be able to tie together the husband and wife or the husband and wives together and uh, something that would be able to support the women whose husbands have died or otherwise the women who are mothers and um, the uh, below 18 and uh, that becomes quite a little bit of a problem because then uh, in Afghanistan in terms of the cultural aspect that I mentioned uh, for a lady to be able to even get access to rental property, they would need to have someone called a maharam who is a male family member uh, to be able to stand in as a guarantor or otherwise as security for them to, even in the list, rent property, even when they can be able to rent. So leave alone being able to own land and to be able to own housing. So the experience we have working with um, the government, uh, we have um, a government that uh, is forward looking, a government that uh, is uh, doing everything possible to be gender inclusive. And what we have done is through the presidential decree uh, is to then put in a scheme that uh, provides full rights to land. And uh, because we know that if you provide only land without being able to provide incentives to develop the land, then the absorption capacity of most of these women could not be able to sustain them to retain and hold on to that land. So we combine that land with the housing and uh, this is permanent housing to ensure that uh, the asset holding uh, comes to bear in terms of em empowering uh, the female headed households, empowering uh, the women that have been widowed, uh, the women whose husbands have died uh, fighting the war and uh, the women that have then return to their country without the possibility of being able to go back to their villages and uh, be uh, compelled to become part of uh, the urban uh, sort of uh, dynamics, the kind of uh, urban 
requirement to have an asset holding that allows you to be then to be able to borrow and to be able to build onto uh, that particular asset holding either using uh, the contribution that come from diaspora. So uh, this is the broad uh, aspect of uh, the PD305. And um, this program basically uh, is being piloted in two provinces. And at the moment, we are happy that uh, the is about 30% of women that have had the strength to be able to apply because traditionally women would not be able to come and apply. And what we did was to select land that uh, is least contested within the urban setting uh, so that uh, they would not feel obliged to need to have a man with them to be able to get the land. And uh, for the 70%, uh, we have a um, uh, sort of a yoke together, both the husband and the wife, where the two of them are still alive uh, to own the property conjointly. And uh, the aspiration of uh, this is that uh, then when uh, the women are participating, disposal of property has to become collaborative and uh, has to become uh, participatory and the development or redevelopment of uh, the people when they return uh, becomes a collective family effort. And um, what we have done again is to work with uh, different UN agencies to ensure that the vulnerability criteria that is put in place in terms of scoring uh, does bring to the fore uh, the women uh, that uh, have the ability to absorb the particular assistance, but however, they also have the ability to be able to uh, put in place the Afghan helps the Afghan uh, kind of dynamic where Afghans uh, do support additional families. And this is especially so with regard to the child mothers that then would not necessarily qualify for this land. Uh, to date, we have uh, 20,000 uh, households that have applied for both Kabul and Herat. And uh, the full intention is to be able to scale up the program uh, to cover not only the two provinces, to scale it up to the total of 29 out of 34 provinces where we have access and uh, there's a willingness on the part of the governors, on the part of the municipal authorities uh, to agree uh, to the requirements and the articles of uh, the presidential decree uh, 305. So with those few remarks, I want to give the floor back to Jim and uh, to say uh, thank you. And I'm more than happy to take as many questions as possible. Over to you. Thank you, David. Thank you. That was um, a really excellent introduction to the topic and also to uh, the work that you are involved in as well. And I imagine it will raise all sorts of questions. What we're going to do is we're going to hear from each of the speakers first and then we'll come back at the end. So if you do have questions or comments, please note them down and um, yeah, we will come to those shortly. Um, so thank you, uh, David. I really appreciate you stepping in there. And um, if, um, if, um, if Azima comes online, we can uh, um, involve her in the discussion as well. So, um, okay, we're going to turn now to um, our next uh, presenter, uh, Mr. Ezatullah Raji, who's a technical advisor with the ICLA program, part of NRC's uh, program in Afghanistan. Uh, so Raji, over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Jim and uh... Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, uh, I'm happy to have this opportunity to join you in this conference. Uh, I, I would like to address a couple of issues in regard to the gender and uh, land rights in Afghanistan. And then I uh, would like to hear from you, uh, your comments and questions. Uh, the first thing that I would like to, to talk about is the uh, legal frameworks that assert, you know, uh, uh, housing, land and property or HIP rights of women uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, as you all know, the legal system of Afghanistan is based on Sharia and, uh, you know, the, the Article 3 of the current constitution of Afghanistan says that no laws in Afghanistan can be against uh, Sharia. So Sharia makes the basis of, of uh, uh, the, the legal system of Afghanistan. So when we look at, at Quran and Hadith, I mean, the, the sayings of Prophet Muhammad, 
uh, as the two main sources of of uh, Sharia, we see that uh, you know the 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 HLP rights of women are recognized. I mean, both Quran and Hadith recognize the right of of women to to the housing, land, and property. So uh, this, I mean. The fact that the legal system of Afghanistan is based on Sharia, you know, has some positives and some negative, you know, aspects, you know, from one hand, it is, you know, good and, you know, in favor of, of women. And from the other hand, it can sometimes, you know, you know, uh, bring some causes, some some challenge uh, for, for the women to access to, to housing, land and property. So, uh, you know, uh, Quran recognizes the rights of women to HLP, whether it is through will, through inheritance, through sale, through different ways and methods that are recognized as the ways to, you know, to acquire ownership in, in Islam or in, in jurisprudence. Uh, but from the other hand, in terms of inheritance, there is some, you know, uh, kind of inequality between men and, and women, as it is very, you know, uh, I think clear for all of you that in, in terms of inheritance, there is some difference between men and, and women. So it is not the case that always women inherit the same share as, you know, get the same share of the inheritance as, you know, uh, as, as uh, the, a man does. So in terms of the legal system, there are a couple of, you know, laws in Afghanistan that, uh, you know, support the women's right to HLP, the constitution, civil code, land management law, and some other regulations that I would not, you know, like to, to go in details. Uh, this uh, uh, PD, Presidential Decree 305 is, you know, one of the, you know, decrees that is, you know, very good source or very good, you know, effort in terms of helping women to access to HLP or you know, right or to acquire ownership. Uh, one point that I wanted to, to say is that, you know, so, so in terms of the, the legal system, there are a lot of, you know, laws, provisions, articles that support, you know, uh, women's right to HLP. But at the same time, there are, you know, some, some issues. Like if we look, for example, at the, you know, personal status law of Shia in Afghanistan, there is, you know, a clear, you know, uh, kind of discrimination between men and women in terms of you know access to 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 inheritance although in in Shari, uh, generally there is some discrimination between men and women in terms of uh, in terms of uh, inheritance because one brother you know gets twice as uh, much a, a, a sister does but in the uh, Shia personal you know status law in Afghanistan uh, unfortunately, a wife, not all women, only wife, does not, you know, get any part, any share of the property of her husband. While according, you know, to the jurisprudence, half of the, uh, of the, you know, what do you call, of the estates or patrimony should go to, to wife under certain uh, circumstances. But this law says that uh, wife does not get any, you know, part from the uh, immovable property, not uh, from where movable property, whether it is, you know, money or anything, that is okay, there is no uh, issue. But when it comes to the immovable property, there is an issue that, you know, wife cannot get, you know, any part of the immovable property. So it is, you know, one example of the challenge that women are facing in terms of, you know, access to, to HLP rights based on the legal system of Afghanistan. I will stop this part here and we'll go to the next issue that I wanted to address. And that is, you know, the, the, the ways that a, a, a woman, 
or women in Afghanistan can, you know, through which they can acquire land or, you know, HLP rights in Afghanistan. So there are different ways based on the based on Sharia and the legal system of Afghanistan, starting from inheritance to sale to, you know, uh, will to donation called Hibbe or other other ways. I would like to to to, to emphasize on, on on inheritance. You know, inheritance is one of the easiest way, one of the easiest ways that a woman can acquire land. And unfortunately, this is somehow, you know, challenged by the customs and by, you know, the, you know, the habits or the norms that are dominating in, in Afghanistan. The, the fact is, unfortunately, that a lot of HLP disputes whether it is related to men or women in Afghanistan are addressed through the informal justice system, through shuras and, and, and jirgas, local shuras and jirgas. So they are not always, you know, uh, referring to the statutory laws, to, to the constitution, to civil code, to, or to other relevant, uh, you know, uh, thank you, James. Uh, so when, you know, a woman wants to obtain his her you know uh, inheritance share. She refers usually to the shura and jirge, and they are not always you know giving her you know her her her, her portion from or her share from from the inheritance. Usually, you know, women are denied from their their inheritance right, or sometimes there is a compromise while they do not get the land itself, in a state they are paid some money, which is always, you know, less than the price that, or, you know, the, uh, the, the price that, you know, the, the, the land would have. So that is, that is, you know, a problem, a big problem that uh, the women are facing with in Afghanistan. The last point that I want to, you know, address, and I would try to finish it in three minutes is, you know, the impacts of, of having access to land for, for women. If women in Afghanistan have access to land, so it will help them a lot. Access to land means that they would be, you know, um, prevented against a lot of protection issues, a lot of, against a lot of violation, especially this, uh, you know, uh, gender-based violence and, you know, uh, domestic violence and different. So, I mean, if a woman, you know, owns her home, her house, own her land and has an, a, a, a source of income, so she would, you know, be able to defend her right, and she would be able, you know, to get access to a lot of other rights that uh, that, that that she has. You know, there unfortunately has have been a lot of cases that women have been, you know, uh, you know, kicked out from whom by their husbands, you know, uh, why because they have not had any, you know, share of uh, on on the on the house. And they then would, you know, face a lot of, you know, protection issues. So I would like to to summarize it that, uh, you know, uh, the impact of having access to to land rights in Afghanistan could be really crucial and, you know, you know, significant for for women in, you know, in terms of being, uh, in terms of enabling them, you know, to get access to other rights and, you know, to be saved against uh, protection risks and issues. I would like to stop here and thank you all. So I would uh, be happy to hear your comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you, Raji, for that um, setting out some of the the legal challenges and and, and the importance also of um, access to land um, for, for for women to realise many of their rights in in many different areas of their lives as well. So thank you for that, and we will definitely come back to you with questions uh, after we've heard our uh, following two speakers. So I want to turn now to um, uh, Felicity Kane, who is. Uh, 
technical advisor on the City for All programme with UN Habitat in Afghanistan. Um, Felicity, over to you. Hi, thank you, Jim. Um, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Uh, my name is Felicity Kane. I am the technical advisor on the City for All programme. And I think I'm joined online today by my uh, colleague, Anthony, who is our CTA. So nice to be here with you all. Today, I will focus um, a little on uh, the contributions of land registration and improved occupancy rights for women in Afghanistan, um, as we've undertaken as part of the City for All program. Well, first, a little background. Um, our data from the 12 cities where we've worked suggests that 84% uh, of city of uh, properties are informal. So only 16% of these actually have uh, formal land ownership documents. And of all properties, only 5% are owned by women. And so as we all know that this insecure land tenure for women underpins and is uh, essentially an indivisible for many of the other challenges faced by Afghan women, particularly those in informal settlements. Um, in Skirland and, and your underpins adequate housing and poor wash conditions. Most residents in Afghan informal areas don't have access to water, sanitation or waste services. And of course, women's role in unpaid domestic labor and childcare um, means they suffer greater negative health effects and uh, more prone to economic shocks than men. Uh, there's also the challenges of economic, lack of economic opportunities, including access to credit. Um, as our colleagues mentioned, that it leaves women facing uncertain land uh, inheritance rights and greater threats of violence, um, and particularly in the context of land disputes. So further, it's, it's incredibly important for identity and self-determination and pride for women. So moving now to um, what I'd like to focus on, which is... Uh, this example of how through the CFA program, the City Foral program, we've been working to address land tenure security for women. Um, I think it's a, it's a practical example of uh, in, on the ground implementation of the voluntary uh, guidance on governance of tenure's recommendations. And specifically it's recommendation that land tenure programs should build on uh, existing or culturally appropriate models. And so we do that using a spectrum of tenure approach. The CFA program is funded by the EU and USAID and it uh, seeks to improve stability and stimulate local economic development and improve land management, thereby uh, strengthening the social contract between the citizens and state uh, working in 12 cities. We, we do this through a three-pronged approach. Firstly, is looking to improve uh, land tenure and security and effective land management, including by surveying and registering all uh, properties in the 12 cities where we work. Second, we support government to improve municipal revenue generation or transparent generation, um, including by uh, generating safai fee, which in Afghanistan translates to a cleaning fee, but in other contexts would be considered a property tax levied by municipalities. Thirdly, we then support government to improve municipal um, urban planning and service delivery, including through projects for upgrading that use the Safai uh, revenue. Uh, so now moving to um, some examples of what uh, specifically under the CFA program we've been doing to improve uh, land tenure security, including for women through the spectrum of tenure approach. We do this primarily through um, the occupancy certificate regulation. Well, so while the 2017 land management law sets out that ownership um, is proved by formal documents, as well as some customary documents, specifically those that are uh, informally document uh, transactions of land that was previously formally recognized, um, this obviously leaves a gap, and that's where the regulation on managing uh, affairs of urban informal properties in 2018 seeks to address. It's also known as the occupancy certificate regulation. So that fills the gap for properties that don't meet the man management law requirements to prove ownership through formal documentation, but they can legally occupy land. So in this way, it helps us to uh, formally recognize these occupancy uh, rights through registration and also through issuance uh, of occupancy certificates provided certain conditions are met. 
This, so the program, we support government to survey all of the properties and then government issue the uh, occupancy certificates. Given these are officially government issued documents, these are regarded as providing a higher degree of tenure for recipients and form as a serve as a form of land ownership documentation that can be upgraded to deeds. In terms of uh, how the program or how the OC regulation furthers access to land for women, there's three things I'd want to highlight. Uh, these are provisions, uh, the following provisions. Firstly, both spouses' names are uh, to be on, to be in the registration process and on the occupancy certificate, thereby providing uh, an equal share of uh, recognition for properties on state land. Second, uh, women have a right to equal share of the property documented with an OC. And thirdly, in the case of female headed households, a property is registered in their names only and, the, um, and OCs are issued to them, thereby removing this risk of, um, of claim by other family members. So through this process, I think there's some interesting data that I'd secondly like to share, uh, including some data on the number of women who have been issued OCs. So far, the program has surveyed 837,000 properties. Uh, so that with an average household of 7.2, that's over 6 million people that have been reached through this in, um, insecure, uh, insecure tenure approach rather. Of those uh, properties we surveyed, 16% have formal documents, 49% have customary, and 35% have uh, no documentation. So that 49% that, that is where we see the gap, uh, the opportunity to improve land tenure security in particular. As I mentioned at the outset, only 5% of properties are owned by women. Though in some cities, in particular in the South, in Spinbolduck and Kandahar, that's at 0%. Whereas in Kabul, it's slightly higher at uh, 7%. Of those own, uh, that are owned by women, 33% have formal ownership, which I think is interesting um, compared to 16% of the national average. Um, presumably, I, I was talking to my colleague Anthony about this previously, that this may indicate that for women uh, to actually own their own land, land, it has to go through the formal system. If, uh, because through, through informal systems, they're less able to claim um, that right to the land. 46% have customary documentation and 21% uh, have no documentation. Compare that to 35%, which is the national average. Well, so secondly, moving to the um, OCs data, we have issued 30,960 OCs. Over half of those, about 56%, are both in the name of men and women. So when you contrast that again to the existing um, national average that's a huge, of any uh, land that's owned by women, that's a huge improvement. We also have 857 of the 30,000 that are in the name of women only, so female-headed households. Um, just to mention, this, this, there are still another 274,000 properties that are eligible for OCs, so we hope to see this scaled up, particularly when some of the bottlenecks to um, OC issuance are addressed. We um, can go into those later uh, if of interest. And uh, finally, I just wanted to end with a couple of other notes on how uh, I see Jim showing his screen on how CFA also supports um, improving land access and land and security for women. That is that uh, through the cadastral uh, uh, territorial units, we have a minimum of four women of the 13 members, and these units are responsible to oversee the property registration and um, community engagement processes and identification of properties. We also involve women through all stages, through the participatory planning and through uh, street addressing as well. And so what I would end with saying is that I think there's a key opportunity in the cases where OCs have been issued to women to then shift our focus to engaging, um, engaging women in the participatory urban planning and service delivery processes so that their role in urban governance um, is, is multiplied across the scales. So I'll stop there and hand over to you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Felicity. Thank you for um, sharing 
again some fascinating um, research figures and and also uh, some of the response of, of the cities for all program that's uh, really interesting i'm sure there'll be some questions coming in on that thank you for those who are sharing your questions um, in the chat box we'll come to those um, uh, later on um, uh, although i see some are answering them there as well so yes whichever works um i'm going to turn now to uh ombretta tempera who is the land specialist with the land housing and shelter unit of, of UN Habitat and she's going to uh, come from a, a more of a global perspective and, and reflect a bit on, on what we've heard here and um, yeah so Ombretta over to you. Um, thanks Jim. Um, I was uh, hello everybody it's nice to see all the colleagues. Um, actually, uh, I would like to share my screen. Uh, it says I cannot share while other participants are sharing, but um, maybe Jim, you can put on my presentation and um, I'll start talking to that. Um, so it's, it's really a pleasure to be in this um, discussion today, which actually, you know, really comes to give some concrete examples, challenges, and lots of progress made on the ground with uh, women land rights. So congratulations to all the people uh, in Afghanistan for this, uh, this really in, you know, inspiring progress. Um, I am just, I was asked to give a little bit of a global perspective, but um, um, maybe more on, um, uh, also bringing in the, the kind of humanitarian development nexus uh, view and uh, on um, uh, land governance in, uh, in particular. So this was a quite uh, broad um, area. So I decided to focus on three points, um, um, which are, uh, sorry, I'm struggling with the, technology um, the well understanding uh, and working within legal pluralistic context secondly uh, the key aspects of women empowerment uh, at the community level and the third one a little bit of broader perspective on land governance I was as I was saying um, next please uh, so for the legal pluralistic uh, aspect. I mean, Afghanistan definitely is not the only one uh, that of the country where we work, uh, there is a yes. challenge with legal pluralism. Uh, and uh, I think while, you know, most of the, the intervention managed to, to work proactively with it, uh, you know, we try to see from other experiences as well, uh, how can be some guidance given in general of how to work within a legal pluralistic context. Um, one obviously would be to understand the different source of law and do a general analysis of each. And then maybe in the short term, try to address those gender gaps, but also other human rights gaps on, you know, gaps that minority face with the specific, uh, you know, maybe the formal system, the, the religious, the customary, etc., to see what can be done in the short term. Uh, but then progressively try to harmonize, align and reconcile the different provisions that are related to land and uh, women access to land in these different systems. Uh, this will allow basically to, to have this different component, not to work against each other and leaving gaps and gray areas and maybe unclarities that are actually proven to disadvantage women and also those who, who are less able to, uh, you know, really smartly or ed engage with each of them, you know, from a perspective maybe of somebody who is more educated and knows better all the system. Um, and therefore, I mean, the least gaps we have and the less, uh, you know, this system are conflicting with each other or sending conflictual messages to the beneficiaries, to the women, to the poor, the better. So this, this is a sort of a, you know, start to work uh, through our, uh, towards an alignment of this system to make sure they work together well. Uh, and then, um, you know, uh, 
ultimately, while we engage, we understand that in the short terms, probably we have no option in some contexts, really, there are no option of choosing which entry point to use, you know, perhaps in some rural areas where really the formal system, the formal legal system really doesn't, is not known sufficiently or the institution don't reach uh, you know, up to there, there is no option really to really engage with the religious or the customary. And we have done some case studies where, for example, even in Niger or in other countries where it really worked well on the short term to engage with the religious and customary system, it's still in, also important to think strategically, you know, on the longer term, what, what would that mean? You know, um, because obviously once, uh, you know, the international community engage with one system somehow weakens the other or there are aspects on the other one. In, in the case, you know, we should be careful not to undermine the, the formal system uh, and think longer term a little bit. Uh, next slide. Um, actually, you know, the, we are working together with the HLP AOR uh, on a set of messages on, on what works actually to increase women access to land in, uh, in fragile contexts. And this document hopefully will be ready soon, hopefully next month. Um, and there is a long list of messages, so I don't want to go through them. Uh, and also it will be very long, but I think the main one really is to empower women at the community level and ensure they are organized and they talk to each other and they are uh, empowered, but also organized. Uh, and this obviously uh, comes through in terms of information sharing, direct practical support, because we see also through different um, NRC researches, for example, in different uh, countries that really a lot of women fail to access land because they lack practical support, not so much maybe on the legal aspect, but really on how to overcome the, the practical steps on how to access the land administration system or the dispute resolution system. Uh, and again, ensure that women are part of decision making processes. Uh, we are also, you know, celebrating the 20 year of governing um, Council, Security Council Resolution 1325, where that really puts women at the center of peace, negotiation, mediation, etc. But we haven't seen that very much yet on the ground. Uh, and uh, and this is really uh, where all of us strive towards that, but I think still uh, there is a lot to be done, especially to ensure that women are part of uh, peace negotiation, peace mediation, but also those processes linked to those broader ones that are related to land and that they are traditionally, uh, I'm not traditionally, like there is evidence that they are systematically fall off, particularly the restitution processes uh, or land and HLP related commissions. Um, these are some of the areas where women actually uh, disappear from the picture in spite of, um, uh, you know, the clear need for them to be there. Uh, next, please. Uh, last point um, is uh, on allow looking broadly, actually, at gender responsive land governance. Um, and here again, where we, we bridge a little bit the HLP perspective, the land rights, uh, you know, of women in, 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 in fragile context through the overall, actually, land governance system. Uh, just to just to recap for ourselves, you know, there are many definitions of this, but uh, we can say that in a nutshell, land governance is the process by which decisions are made regarding the access and use of land, the manner in which those decisions are implemented, and the way the conflicting interests around land are reconciled, right? So this is a little bit the spectrum. If we see the next uh, slide, um, this is the way it looks uh, a little bit on the, uh, you know, all together. When we talk about HLP rights, we can see the, the, the green uh, box, which is, says land tenure, uh, which is obviously, and, uh, you know, underpinned by the land policy framework, the institution, the land inform information infrastructures. But uh, let's say if we look at overall land management and land administration functions, um, there is land tenure, but there is also land value, land use, land development. Uh, I mean, this obviously is one model, there can be others, but this is the one the Global Land Tool Network usually uses uh, to actually unpack how land management and land administration 
uh, can be you know, described. And all of these components need to be gender responsive, gender inclusive. Um, just to give uh, some uh, examples, um, in the next slide, uh, you know, obviously when we talk about legal policy framework, uh, there is need to improve and make them gender uh, inclusive in the process, but also amend those parts that are not gender responsive. Uh, there is need to align the different legal uh, system. Uh, and this might be, you know, a number of laws that are, you know, beyond um, uh, the, the formal one. Uh, the et cetera, et cetera, the institution. But uh, overall, at the end, a little bit linked to the fact that women need to be empowered and be enabled to participate, it's very important that women employment in the land administration function uh, and land administration organization is supported, encouraged, encouraged and really, uh, you know, pushed forward. Because only uh, when the land administration system overall will not be perceived as a male only sector, that's where all the rest will come along. Uh, secondly, the process need to be less bureaucratic, faster, cheaper, cheaper and not require excessive documentation. This is really proven to be what really blocks women more than anything else, more even than the law, more than the inheritance system for, uh, blocks women from accessing land rights. And this would obviously be very inclusive also to men, or poor men, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, remove practical barriers. I think I spoke to that earlier. Simplify it, uh, make it accessible. Uh, and, uh, you know, overall, these are general guidance, but clearly, uh, you know, when there is an assessment of the gender responsiveness of the land administration system in the specific context, that's where, you know, specific targeted measures can obviously be designed and, and made tailored to that. Uh, so this is just, uh, that, that's it. That's what I wanted to say um, on this, uh, you know, for this discussion. Uh, to give a glimpse a little bit of the broader picture beside HLP rights, land rights, and uh, I'm happy to, to take any questions or inputs from, from the floor. Back to Jim, thank you. Thank you, Ombretta. Uh, thank you for giving that, um, yeah, that, that sort of global sense of what's going on and some of the uh, things that you've been working on to uh, respond to, uh, to, to some of these issues. I appreciate that a lot. Now, um, so we've got about 10, 15 minutes um, to um, have some discussion. Um, as you'll have seen in the chat box, there's been a number of questions that have already been posed and, and some of these have, have been answered. What I intend to do is, um, I'm going to just frame a couple of the questions that have been asked um, uh, and, and then ask, um, ask whoever of the panelists wants to respond uh, to respond. And Azima, I don't know if you've joined us, but if you have, please, you're very welcome to respond as well. Um, so I thought I'd begin just by grouping some questions that have come together that, that speak a little bit about protection risks and power and, and those kind of things. So we've heard from Jenny, Mona, Eloa and Evelyn. Um, so when securing land to women, have you experienced any protection risks related to women owning land alone um, around harassment? Um, also, what's done to avoid the overburdening of women with land ownership, for example, payment of expensive taxes. Related to this, how does the programme mainstream protection not have an indirect harm by increasing violence against women due to access to land? And again, again, related to that, um, how do, do these programmes address power relations between men and women? Um, so I, I open those up to, uh, to our panellists. Um, uh, Raji, that might kind of feature in some of the work you've done. Um, I know, David, it sounds like it really relates to the work you've been involved in as well. And Felicity on Bretta, I really welcome your um, inputs on that. So, um, yeah, would, would one of you like to respond to that general area? Yeah, um, Jim, uh, with your indulgence, I would uh, just want to Certainly. sort of... Uh, uh, top up a few of uh, the responses that I've shared with uh, Jenny and uh, Evelyn. Uh, it's not uh, the easiest of the things to do, uh, if I must be honest. It has involved a lot of uh, persuasion, has involved a lot of um, alternate uh, uh, legislation. Uh, while uh, my colleague Felicity and Anthony will be able to share a little bit of what they have done with regards to the municipal law, while they'll be able to share in terms of what they have done in terms of uh, working within the cause of the city, especially with the occupant certificates, 
looking at the question of uh, land grabs, looking at the question of the place of women within the urban fabric, looking at uh, the entirety of uh, the question of uh, displacement vis-a-vis -vis the social fabric that has been sort of the mainstay in Afghanistan. Now, uh, Afghans have a unique attribute of uh, the transnational networks and uh, intranational networks that uh, we then had to, <clears throat> had to really study to be able to understand how do these networks come into play uh, in terms of being able to create a new space uh, within the context of the new settlements that we were trying to put in place. And the uh, question was, <clears throat> how do you find neutral land that uh, is less contested so that at least they have a little bit of a breather uh, to be able to establish themselves, establish themselves one, as part of uh, the small localized governance structures, two, as part of the quasi-municipal governance structures, and then how could we uh, restructure the way we do our urban planning uh, to be responsive to this new dynamic of, uh, say, a lady that left to Pakistan or left to Iran and uh, comes back to the mother country and they can't be able to go to their village of origin. Uh, they have established new friends. How do you bring them together? So from the Shura perspective, and I'll give way to Felicity and I should Azima be online, she'll be able to speak more within a personal context, uh, how that works. So to be able to work out, we then created a program called reintegration. Reintegration meaning a social reengineering process. Uh, there's no culture. These are people from uh, kicked out of Copenhagen, kicked out of uh, Europe, returned back to either as a voluntary repatriation or otherwise as a uh, involuntary repatriation based on uh, how they were able to reach those particular uh, places that they hoped to be able to get a little bit of relief. So when they return back, their culture has changed. They are no longer nomads, they are no longer coaches. Their culture is uh, sort of fragmented. How do you bring them back together? So it's an entire social engineering process where uh, the friendship that is uh, developed in the indignity of uh, those refugee camps comes to bear in terms of creating new little microcosms of a new culture that then is able to work within the voting cluster under the citizen charter program and within the general context of uh, the national solidarity program, we then use those to be able to apply them within the urban new, the new urban architecture of uh, re-establishing those communities within the sense of their new experiences, not their old experiences. So none of them has a place ownership. They both must have a new place ownership. That's how we play around. So those are my few remarks and I give the floor to either Felicity or Anthony. If they're online, they could be able to share within uh, the context of what do they do within the cause of the city while we try to encompass the peripherals of the city to expand the space and make that space less contested as uh, it were. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, yeah, Felicity, would you like to uh, come in there? or Anthony, if, uh, whoever's. <laughs> okay, sure, thanks, um, Jim. I can um, build on that a little, and it, I think in response to, uh, I think it was Everlyn's um, question on what did the program also do to address power relations. Um, her point was right, that it's, it's I mean, documentation or registration of flights is only one step. Um, and so I would, I would emphasize this why the program, the CFA program, we work in this three-pronged approach. So it's, it's not just um, issuing occupancy rights, it's also um, engaging women through broader urban development processes, but specifically through, well, as I mentioned earlier, there's the CTUs, the de cadastral territorial units, which have a minimum of four women of the 14 members, and they play a key role in overseeing, um, in, like, overseeing the land processes. Uh, so when a property is surveyed, it's advertised, um, so that the ownerships can be confirmed through the community. Uh, and these committees are responsible to oversee that. Any land dispute, and as per the OC regulation, uh, if there are any land disputes that involve women specifically, uh, at least one female member from the CTU must be involved in that dispute committee. And so I think that that involvement, not just in the CTUs, but in broader um, goals are assembly, networks and community development council networks which are similar to CTUs but in all urban areas of Afghanistan so these are area-based networks 
are also minimum quotas of women. And these um, community-based networks serve a key role. They're registered with the municipalities. They serve a role um, in broader urban development planning processes. For example, um, as per the municipal law of 2018, uh, all local municipal plans uh, and budgets should be consulted through these committees and uh, CDCs in particular uh, play a key role in, in the, they have women's committees who also play, play a key role in con, uh, selecting and implementing projects for the communities. And so I, I, I highlight this as an example of how we seek to actually build a stronger relationship between women and the community and also position position women in a, in a capacity that enables them to take decisions for their local urban area. Another example is through the strategic municipal action planning process. So we support governments uh, to utilize the participatory urban planning approach to develop local municipal plans. And that includes through um, consultations uh, with ensuring that there are a minimum 20 to 40% of women um, who are participating and and ensuring the identification of uh, projects that are focused specifically for women. And so I think this is one example of this stepping stone approach to not just give women um, more secure land rights, and, as Ambretta said, but also use this community driven approach to um, further strengthen the role of, of women as uh, local urban leaders. So thank you, Felicity. I'll just, uh, sorry, I'm just no. uh, aware of time. So I'll just turn to, Stop there. Um, thank you, thank you. Um, I'll just turn quickly to Ombretta and then uh, Raji, I'll turn, come to you for a comment as well. Um, Ombretta. Yes, thanks uh, a lot. I think there's an element of, uh, you know, women um, being victim of violence because of claiming their rights is, is, is faced in many communities. Um, at different levels. And uh, what worked uh, from some of the case studies we analyzed is that, um, you know, the, the promotion of women land rights shouldn't be like as a standalone uh, process, but should come together as a package of basically su supporting uh, gender empowerment, women empowerment, um, and for example, in some cases where there have been, uh, you know, uh, women land rights, I think this because it was in Jordan, uh, women land rights pushed ahead at the same time as programs to, you know, address gender-based violence, as well as um, consistent uh, and targeted messages from the leadership, from the highest level of leadership, you know, the the royal family that, uh, you know, this is important and this is the way uh, the country is going that proved to be effective. So, you know, I think having an intervention that really tries to change one of the dynamics while leaving the others as they are, it can be more risky than having a sort of a whole, uh, a whole of society approach as much as, you know, obviously this, this is difficult, but, uh, but it's important. And really the engagement of the leadership at the higher levels, the highest level proved to, to, to be useful uh, on that, in that. Thank you. Thank you, Ombretta. Um, Raji, did you have any comment on that question? And also there was another couple of questions specifically directed to you, which we can look at as well. Uh, yeah, I think the, the, the colleagues addressed uh, all, all, all the issues, but I would like to, to you know, address the two questions that, was, that were specifically addressed to me. Yes. So I, I think, the first question was about the, you know, the future perspective of the women rights, specifically related to HLP in Afghanistan. I think there have been good uh, improvements in this regard, in this regard recently, uh, with the two, you know, regulations. First, this uh, uh, PD 305, and then this uh, land management informal uh, lands in urban areas. Th these two regulations are, you know, very, you know, uh, good steps in terms of, you know, uh, securing the land uh, rights of women because these two regulations, you know, require the, uh, the relevant authorities to put the name of, of, of the wife 
as the, the shareholder or as the partner you know, on the title, deed, which is very good, you know, progress. So with, with this, you know, progress, I am hoping that access to HLP rights for women in Afghanistan would increase and, uh, you know, with the support of the humanitarian actors and, you know, human agencies in terms of uh, this issue. So the other question that was uh, at risk, I think uh, it was about the uh, expropriation, if I am not mistaken. We have a law in Afghanistan for the expropriation and uh, there is no difference between men and women. I mean, if based on the law and uh, under certain circumstances, your land is expropriated by the government, so you are you know, entitled to compensation. So there is no difference between men and women as far as I know based on the on, on the law in this regard. The last point that I wanted to to add here is uh, you know about the displaced people because we in our in NRC are working uh, the, for the you know displaced people, IDPs, uh, internally displaced people and persons and refugee returnees. Refugee returnees and IDPs are, you know, uh, in a, you know, uh, what to say, in a, in a harder situation in terms of accessing, you know, or practicing, exercising their HLP, HLP rights for different issues, you know, including the fact that they are, you know, uh, they are in a you know lower position in terms of you know economical situation so they would not be able you know even to you know to effort the 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 you know cost of taking a case through the formal justice uh, system so that is why they are you know more you know uh, vulnerable to the protection risks that can you know arise from lacking uh, from from the lack of access to to land and HLP rights in in general. That's it. Thank you, thank you, Raji. Um, so I'm mindful of time. Now I'm happy to stay around and keep this going for another ten minutes or so. And but people may have to drop off. So just want to, in case people do have to leave, just want to say thank you so much for being here and for the presenters sharing and then answering questions. Um, and just to highlight that. Um, uh, this 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 webinar was part of the themes related to this are uh, um, uh, a part of something that's being uh, developed in Afghanistan. Uh, there's a legal brief about to be released by the HLP task force on a brief guide to women's land rights in Afghanistan. So do look out for that. We'll be sharing about that within the HLP AOR and as well, I'm sure there's many other channels as well. And this discussion we're hoping will kind of feed and contribute into a maybe a one or two page of policy document. So again, thank you so much for your comments and please keep them coming and we will be, make sure we note everything down and, and keep a hold of it. Um, the recording of this event will be made available through the protection cluster and other kind of via YouTube and, and elsewhere. Um, and I'll be updating on, on the uh, HLPO our website as well as the newsletter. I'm just going to put the uh, link if anyone wants to sign up to that newsletter in the uh, in the chat box. And I'm also going to put in my email address as well in case you need to get in touch with me for anything and uh, to be put in touch with other colleagues. Um, so in the meantime, just that was by way of making sure that information has been shared, but um, we can carry on discussing for another 10, 10 or so minutes. So Anthony, or should I say Huawei P30 Pro, um, I believe you would like to uh, make a comment. Uh, yeah, so this is Anthony uh, appearing as Huawei. Um, I work with Felicity in Afghanistan in the same program. Uh, I'd just like to put in two very quick comments. And these are actually coming from questions asked by, I believe, Evelyn. So um, uh, her first comment is not to be taken lightly. The idea that in some contexts, for especially um, uh, Muslim majority countries, uh, power relations might be disturbed uh, by some interventions uh, where there are protection risks that, um, that uh, come up uh, between uh, spouses at household level or even at community level. Uh, this is very true. It's been seen in many countries. Uh, I've been told that there's a certain amount of uh, of stress or uh, 
uh, yeah, of stress that has been caused in some households in Afghanistan. Um, I've even heard of, uh, of divorces or potential divorces that have come uh, out of the idea that, uh, that these occupancy certificates uh, will now be registered in the name of both spouses, giving uh, equal uh, rights to, uh, to spouses. So it's, it's uh, a reality uh, that has been seen and it's something not to be taken uh, lightly and any interventions uh, should perhaps uh, have elements that uh, take care of such uh, externalities. Second point I'd like to uh, comment on is, although registration is not everything in terms of uh, mainstreaming uh, HIP rights for women, it is extremely important, especially in the context of uh, formal rights. Uh, registration is very important. As you know, the two most important uh, rights uh, that are given by ownership, uh, registration for ownership and ownership documents is the rights to use and the rights to dispose. When there is registration, formal registration, it works very well for women uh, because it restricts the right to dispose by husbands or spouses. They cannot dispose uh, property uh, by way of sell or by way of lease when it is registered in the woman's name. So it's extremely important and in formal contexts, it, it is the game changer, I would say. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Anthony, for those comments. Um, and just one thing to mention as well uh, within the the chat, I know Umbretta shared some uh, examples of case studies, so uh, a link to those. So please do have a look at those. Um, would anyone like to uh, raise a question or make a comment in the participants? Is, uh, please do, um, you know, feel free to raise your hand or, um, or come in. Otherwise, I can turn to another question. OK, so. Please do continue to uh, add questions or, or, or do raise a hand to, to get my attention. Um, uh, I just want to turn to a question that came in um, around. There's been this actually bit of a theme that's emerged is, is the you know what happens with some of the in terms of the power imbalance and Anthony touched on it there when sometimes there are these difficulties in having those rights actually fully realised and and what does that mean in in, in the home and, and in the community. Um, and I think there's a question that's coming around land disputes, are they gender responsive? And how can we better address specific barriers to access to just in the justice that women face? So this obviously relates to promoting protecting land rights, but also more broadly. I wonder if uh, people have comments on that, particularly um, maybe experiences where that's that's been um, achieved or there's been some progress, because obviously there's a lot of challenges there, but are there things that have worked, things that we can learn from? Uh... I would like to add a comment on, on this. Yes. Uh, so, you know, as, as I said, you know, the land disputes, you know, are time consuming in terms of, you know, you know to, to be resolved. So that is why, whether it is, you know, through, especially if it is through the formal justice system, through court, you know, some land disputes, some land cases can take like two, three or five years, even 10 years, you know, to be resolved. So that is why a lot of people, you know, prefer to take it through the informal justice system, you know, this uh, local shuras and jirgas. And, uh, you know, because these uh, informal justice systems are not necessarily, you know, accountable and responsible to the government, so they do, you know, their work and they, you know, address the uh, legal disputes. Unfortunately, because, you know, of the, the, of the culture and because of the context, uh, what happens is that, you know, the decision is made against women usually and you know in favor of of uh, of men especially you know if it is you know the, the one party male uh, male and one, one party female you know I, I can give you a lot of examples from what we have experienced working for years with uh, idps and returnees in terms of hlp you know uh, a lot of sisters who 
you know, uh, claim their inheritance share from their brothers. So when it goes through the Shura and Jirga, they want to, you know, come with a reconciliation, with kind of, you know, an agreement, which does not necessarily mean that the, 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 the sister, I mean, the, the woman would, uh, you know, receive whatever the share that she is entitled uh, to. So part of it actually is because, you know, the Shura and Jirga or informal justice system thinks that, you know, if they, you know, push and force the, the main, you know, to, to, you know, give the inheritance share, the portion to, to the women, it can re result in, you know, a, uh, what do you call it, intention, family tension or disputes, whatever, or some, you know, uh, the hostility between the, this, uh, this, uh, the, the family members. So that is why they think somehow, you know, to, to uh, reach an agreement, which is somehow good. I mean, uh, uh, in, in the state of having nothing, it would be good to, to have something, but it is not uh, always, you know, fair, and it does not always mean that they would, you know, with justice. So that is why NRC, we in RC have tried to build the capacity of the uh, justice actors, both formal and informal through, you know, capacity building trainings and a mentorship program in terms of, you know, HLP issues. So they would receive three day capacity building trainings and a series of uh, mentorship program to make sure that they you know have first the knowledge the skills and the attitude you know to to address the hlp cases responsibly especially when it comes to to women uh, hlp cases thank you thank you raji um ombretta i see a hand raised i is that a, a fresh hand Yes, thank you. It's a fresh hand. Sorry to to take the space again. I just That's wanted good. to to uh, to agree with what the tool just said, and uh, that say uh, it was witnesses also in other um, contexts. For example, uh, in the Gaza Strip, um, with the, you know, in the uh, you know when the conflictuality actually increased, there was an increase of number of women who were actually resorting to religious and um, you know community based dispute resolutions uh, in spite of uh, of those being um, you know less in terms of the less gender responsive in terms of the provision that they had and uh, and exactly the the reason was i mean not only that they were cheaper and faster but that would uh, allow them to basically keep access to the main uh, resource uh, that for them is the, the protection and the affiliation with the family, uh, you know, breaking the, the family ties, you know, especially in, in conflicts, in context where women already face many challenges would really be the last resort, uh, you know, even if it's about claiming inheritance, nobody would, no woman would do that unless this is really the last option to really feed the kids on something like that. Uh, the other aspect is the enforcement, you know, especially in, in fragile contexts where law enforcement and enforcement of decision taken is obviously a challenge. Um, there is, a, you know, we can see that if we have a less conflictual, uh, you know, uh, decision made is more likely that actually the community will come together and try to enforce it. My question is, um, and I think was raised also in some other reports uh, done by, by various organizations, um, I think also related to the case of Afghanistan, what is the, what is the long term uh, you know, implication of uh, as uh, sustaining such dispute resolution mechanisms on the long run. Um, you know, is there a way to, to combine the short term gains uh, with a sort of a bit of a longer term, uh, you know, sustainability, uh, you know, of, of the, 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 the dispute resolution vision, what's our dispute resolution vision, I would say in terms of land. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ombretta. And I think that's um, 
yeah, a really important point and a good place uh, to uh, finish the discussion for today. How do we think longer term uh, about these these interventions? What is the the transition? How do we see that shift to um, those sort of more nexus perspectives and, and working with other actors and, and and within the country, within with government, with uh, other actors in country as well? How do we get that longer term perspective? So, thank you. I want to say thank you to David, to and Azima, to Raji, uh, Felicity, and Ombretta for your uh, really engaging presentations and for fielding the questions. Thank you for all those who've uh, contributed questions and uh, raised issues and for listening in as well. Um, we're going to finish the, the discussion now. Um, just want to say thank you again and I'm going to leave the the sort of the meeting open for a little while in case anyone wants to add anything into the chat box just to make sure we've got all your comments and uh, questions in that we can then sort of feed into the broader uh, reporting process. Um, thank you to um, particularly to Ben and Patricia of the HLP um, Task Force in Afghanistan, who've been uh, you know, organizing this and, and arranging this event. And, and as again, just want to say, look out for the legal brief, a brief guide to women's land rights in Afghanistan, which will be um, released uh, soon. And um, yeah, I really look forward to keeping in touch. Um, you've got my email and you can sign up for the uh, mailing list. It won't be spam, I promise. It will be a, a monthly newsletter and maybe invites to events like this. And also to join in with a thematic group we have around women's HLP rights, as well as many other things as well. So uh, please do um, get in touch and otherwise look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you all.